Hey guys, do you know what kind of game we haven't done on U Spot Gaming yet? That's right, card games! Now, the game that I'm going to be touching upon today is a game that I've been playing for a little while, and it's actually been out for like two or three years on the market, as far as I know, and it's a game called Force of Will. Now, I'm going to say the one thing that everybody knows, but a lot of people don't want to hear, or maybe everybody does want to hear. In my opinion, it's the answer to over-competitive, over-clunky, over-complicated, in my opinion, way overpriced Magic the Gathering. And, in fact, that's actually why me and a couple of my buddies started playing this game. We walked into our local card game store, I saw the best alternative to Magic the Gathering and not a waifu game, though I guess this card is a little bit deceiving in that sense, and I said, hey, this game seems relatively simple, and it's getting more complicated, but that's not a problem, it's actually enriching the game. And the best part of it was that it was really, really cheap to pick up and play. Now, the deck that I want to go over today is actually one of the J Rulers from the five starter decks that was released during the... What was it? The Case... No, Curse of the Frozen Casket back in September. This particular ruler is a ruler known as Feath Singh. Six Sage of Wind. Now, a lot of people, what they actually end up doing is they pronounce this card's name Feet Sting. No, it's, uh, it's Feet Sting. Also, if you see a little bit of shakiness to the video, I apologize. I am currently recording on my cell phone, or to those who are more linguistically inclined, my cellular device. Because unlike Nova and Dorian J, I am poor AF, and this is pretty much all I can do. I don't have a fancy camera or Mike. So, hope you guys enjoy my crappy video. Now, Feath Singh represents one of only two top-tier J rulers currently in the North American and international circuit. That tier I've either heard been called Uber or Zero Tier, and other than Feath Singh, the other J ruler that occupies that tier currently is the Eternal Vampire, Mikage Saijiro. He is probably one of my favorite J rulers to come out with the most recent starter deck pack, but I'll do a review on him at a later time. Feath Singh's Judgment is a whopping 5 cost. Not the highest I've ever seen, but definitely not the lowest. But when you see what her Judgment does, you'll see it's definitely worth it. So it's a 5 cost, 2 green and 3 colorless. And she has the new ability, Energize. Now, all of the J rulers that came out from the set of... Uh, Curse of the Frozen Casket and the starter decks that came out with it have this new system and I am super psyched to see that they're planning on redoing a bunch of the old ones. Right now they've uh, announced four of them and what they're doing is they're giving old rulers Energize and they're releasing them with updated more competitive, uh, what is it, God's Arts and Judgments and I think it's just a very good way to keep the shops interested in this because a lot of the people that need those new cards, what they need to do is they get three of three or four different types of cards, which I know for a fact I did not have the cards I needed for the ones that I want to trade in. So you go to your local shops, the shops give you the cards, you buy them, they're given additional value to cards that right now are very inexpensive. And it keeps the shops and the players interested in the cards, which allow for the shops to make enough business to keep bringing in the new sets, which supports the card game, the creators, and the players of the game. Anyway, so I just thought that that's really cool, and I'm psyched that they're doing that with the old rulers, and Energize is super cool. Okay, enough fanboy. Its secondary ability is whenever you play your second card each turn, and the emphasis here, folks, is on each turn, that includes yours and your opponent's turn, you put a 1-1 Wind Elf Resonator token onto the field. This is groundbreaking. This is amazing. This is probably the first card to my knowledge. You know, I'm not super, super competitive in this card game, but I'm okay. To my knowledge, this is the first card that does crazy mass token production. It's not going to be the last, but it's definitely the first, maybe kind of as far as I know. Don't quote me on that. Oh my god, it's so good. Okay, so let's say you get off the five judgment. Its J ruler side is an 8-8. Eight, eight. For 5, it seems kind of under-impressive, but the abilities that it has is amazing. So, it's an 8-8, eight, eight, 5 Judgment. Other elves you control gain plus 4, plus 4. So, all of those crazy little tokens you created before you popped it for its Judgment, 
Now are five fives at the least. If you don't have other buffs, if you don't have the fields, if you don't have other things on it. Its second ability is, whenever you play your second card each turn, put two 1-1 one, one Elf Resonator tokens on the field. Put two 1-1 one, one Elf Resonator tokens onto the field. How insane is that? It's essentially exactly like its previous side on its ruler side, but better in every way. Now, from the five rulers that were released with the starter decks and the five rulers that were released with the booster boxes, I'm pretty sure that this is the only one that keeps its abilities from one side to the other and improves them. That's amazing. Now, the way that I decided to make this particular deck, I took a majority... Okay, maybe not a majority. I took one-third, roughly, of the original Feath Sing deck that came out, and I kept a bunch of the cards that were useful, took out the ones that I thought I didn't really need, and I know that a few of you will disagree with the ones I decided to take out, and I decided to pop in black. This is my Worshippers of the Dark Cthulhu Elves of the Black Woods deck. Now, anybody, and I mean anyone who's running a Feath Sing deck, should be running this little puppy right here. It is Tama, familiar of the Holy Wind, a cute little cat with a lot to bat. It is a 2-2, one green drop resonator that has two amazing abilities. First of all, when this card enters the field, you draw a card. This is so fundamentally important for running Feet Sling. If you want to get off your two spells Every turn, including your turn and your opponent's turn, you need to have continuous card draw. You need to have a bunch of cards in your hand. Its secondary ability is amazing. Banish this card. This card deals 200 damage to target Resonator. Now, let's say that your opponent has that one black drop uh, Cthulhu Resonator that if it do deals damage to target J slash Resonator, it kills it. And it's making you stall out because you don't know whether or not you should attack because he's just going to use it to chump block and take out your big guys. Well, guess what? You drop this guy for one drop. That's one towards counting the two spells every turn for your tokens for Feet Sing. You get to draw, you pop it, and you deal 200 damage. Not a problem. I run four of these guys. They are amazing. Now for my two drop resonator. In this deck, my two drop resonator is Red Riding Hood, which is a two hard cast green, three, four with a whole basket full of goodies in terms of awesome abilities and is probably one of my favorite green resonators that came out in the Curse of the Frozen Casket set. Now one of the things that kind of sucks about Red Riding Hood is the fact that she's a fairy tale and not in fact an elf and for the longest time I made that misconception and I guess it's probably just because I'm still a new player but come on, come on, she looks like a freaking elf, right? Right, I knew it. I knew I knew it was right. I know I was right. Okay, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so she has a bunch of abilities. First of all, when this card is put into a graveyard from your field, put the top card of your Magic Stone deck into your field rested. Now, the important part of this ability is the fact that the stone comes in rested. A lot of people either choose or otherwise to forget the fact that it comes in rested and not recovered, but that's important. The second ability is, this card gains plus 400 plus 300 as long as you control 5 or more magic stones. And the third and final abilities are, this card gains swiftness, first strike, and precision as long as you control 7 or more magic stones. You'll see that in this deck, with how quickly we ramp out stones and ramp out mana, and I will call will mana a bunch of times, so just deal with it now. Um, it's super easy to get her up to being a 7-7 seven, seven with precision, swiftness, and first strike. Like, if you start off with the Energize in this particular deck, there's a very good chance that by turn 3, you'll have those 5 stones, and by turn 4, you'll have 7. Okay, let's move on to the Splash of Black, the precursor to the madness that is Cthulhu. Oh, blocked my light there. Okay, so, this is my 3-drop Resonator in this deck, and it is the first black. Now, you're looking at this guy, and you're thinking, Eddie... Priest of Darkness, Abdul Al Al Hazarid, Al Hazarad, Al Hazarid. He's a three cost, two hard cast black, seven seven. He really doesn't seem all that impressive. Though, oh my god, look at the art on this. It's so beautiful. Okay. The reason why I'm running this crazy Mama Jama in this deck is because of his ability. Right? So he's got the ability. Tap two black and two colorless, banish this card, and you may put a Cthulhu... 
you may put a Cthulhu resonator from your hand into your field. How freaking amazing is this? Okay, anybody who's playing the current set right now knows that in Curse of the Frozen Casket, a crazy ground smashing 2020 or 2000 2000 resonator Cthulhu came out. And this guy, instead of making you pay eight, helps you cheat it in for four, right? The three to cast this guy and the four to sack him to put him onto the field. And the awesome thing is, is that if you play your cards right, you can play this dude as early, no, well, not this dude, the Cthulhu guy, as early as turn four. Now, the thing that I like to do in this particular set, or in this particular deck, I should say, is I'll leave four mana open during my turn and pass turn. Now, near the end of my opponent's turn, when they're about to pass turn to me, I'll sack this guy, grab my Cthulhu from my hand, place him onto the field, and suddenly it's like he's got haste because I cast him during the end of my opponent's turn, and he can attack as soon as it's my turn. Now, I think that's how the ruling works. Do not quote, on, quote me on it, but I think that that's how it works. This guy is money. I love them, and I'm running four of them. Oh, by the way, I'm running three of the Riding Hoods, just in case they didn't say. Okay, now for the big boss. The bee's knees, the win con of my deck. Azathoth, Hunter of Reality. You cannot imagine how unbelievably psyched I was when I got this. I got three of these guys, three full art ones during the draft for Frozen Casket. Oh, so good. Okay, so as far as I know, he is a two hard cast, um, eight drop. Um, so two black and six colorless. 2020, I think the strongest resonator that exists in Force of Vol currently. And he has pretty much a small master's thesis for his abilities. Okay, let's delve in. So, Resonator, Human Cthulhu, and he's got Limit 6. This card enters the field with a with 6 limit counters, mind you, on it. And whenever this card attacks or blocks, remove a limit counter from it. If this card would be destroyed, you may remove a limit counter from it instead. If you do so, remove all damage from it. This card essentially has 6 instances of indestructible. How freaking amazing is that? Now... The last two abilities are both the best thing ever and the worst thing you can imagine, okay? So here we go. Whenever this card attacks or blocks, destroy target resonator. So that means that if he blocks, you can uh, block the creature, most likely kill it because you're a 2020 and there's nothing else that ex exists that's stronger than it at its base strength, and then choose to destroy something else. And that's the crazy part. Check it out. Focus, 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 focus. Destroy target J slash resonator. This thing is a freaking zero destroyer. Oh, I love it. Now, the final ability, I wish I could just erot it. I wish I could just put white out over it and not worry about it. But here we go. At the end of turn, if there are no limit counters on this card, destroy it. If you do, this card deals 2,000 damage to you. So... With uh, great power comes great punch you in the face, because if this guy sticks around for his six limit counters, he has no more, and then he dies, you just lost half your starting life total. But most likely what's going to happen is that somebody's going to do uh, Charlotte's transformation magic onto it, and turn it into a bear, and then kill it with some burn aggro crap. So this is my lord of madness, my guy who is being worshipped by the, by the dark elves of the Black Forest, and he is pretty much the theme of this deck aside from Feet Sting. Okay, let's get on to our chants and additions. Alright, the first of my chants is a one hard cast green spell called Rapid Growth, in my opinion is a staple that should be in every Feet Sting deck or in any hard hitting aggressive green deck ever. And that's because it has Remnant. Oh my goodness, I love Remnant. I love this ability. So it's, I mean, for anybody who doesn't know what Remnant is, is you may play this card from your graveyard. If you do, remove it from the game instead of putting it anywhere else, anytime that it would leave the chase. And it has target J slash Resonator. Yeah, I know. Target J slash Resonator gains plus 400, plus 400 until the end of turn. Now, the reason why I think that every Feet Sting deck should have these, and the reason why I personally run four, and yeah, I know, oh, Mr. Fija, 
you know, why are you running four of them? They have Revenant, therefore you're technically running eight. Why not run three or two and then clear up some slots for other cards in your deck? And what I have to say to you is, you know, shush, let me let me do my video. This is my deck. You can uh, do however you want when you're doing yours. But uh, realistically, the reason why I run four of these in my token-producing, Cthulhu-smashing, Thiefsting deck is because if you can reliably see two, three, even all four of these every game, that means you've got two, three, or four different instances during your opponent's turn where you can cast this bad boy, either from your hand or from the grave, and you can do it twice, right? Because you can choose to target one, and then follow up the chase by casting it again from your grave, if you're casting it from your hand, or you have more than one from your grave, to do two instances of spell casting to your opponent's turn, so you can get additional tokens during that turn, as opposed to just utilizing it during your own turn, which I think is amazing. The second of my chance for this deck is another one of these one cast green, which is called Secluded Elven Village Amon Sul. I think that's a U. Yeah, Amon Sul. And it is a field edition, or an edition, I don't know if they call them field editions in this game. And it has the abilities Elf J slash Resonators you control get plus zero plus 200, so 200 to defense. And J slash Resonators your opponents control with flying cannot attack your Resonators. J slash resonators, your opponent's control with flying cannot attack your resonators. What the hell? You don't even need elves. That just means that all of your guys are pretty much immune to being attacked by flyers. And then finally, J slash resonators you control can block J slash resonators with flying. So essentially, you don't need any flying in this deck. All of your elf tokens have just become bodies to jump in front of those gwivers in front of those gwivers, because that's pretty much what you're going to see in terms of crazy flyers smashing you in the face, those titanias, right? So this thing, and uh, let me really stress the fact that you need to have four of these in your deck. Most people will run two, most people will run three, but I run four because they're one drops, and you really need one drops in this deck so that you can constantly drop those cheap spells since I don't run any regalia. And they continuously buff your stuff. They give all of your stuff accumulated buffs to their defense and they give them flying and that because it's j slash resonator that includes feet sting that's amazing now we get to the well in my opinion the best part of this deck which is the rampa dampa ding dong the super super it's good to own land will magic stone ramp portion so another amazing card that came out in this particular set is the magic stone analysis and then you've got feet sing right on the card there it is a two cost one green and one colorless it's a chant that says search your magic stone for a non-special magic stone and put it into your field then shuffle your magic stone deck now the thing that's amazing about running four of these things is that if you can get energized first turn and you grab a stone you can tap this thing grab another stone and it hits your field recovered okay then you tap that for one of your one drop resonators like um your your cat or your field or something like that you've just cast two spells on your first turn you've got two stones and you just got a free elf token i run four they're amazing you should run four you should just stop playing all the decks just run a deck full of nothing but magic stone analysis do it you'll win everything you'll win life I just realized that making the comment, it's good to own land, makes absolutely no sense because this is not Magic the Gathering and you do not, in fact, tap land for mana. But you know what? Screw it. These are lands. These are rocks. These are stones. You can call them whatever you want. So, uh, yeah, in the tradition of the Great White North and having vast tracts of land, or stones, or whatever you want to call them, I have another three stone land mana ramp cards here, which are Blessing of Idrazil. The magical tree from Norse mythology, or Treesus, as a lot of people call it, call it in this card game. Now, this is one of the first cards that are not from this particular like set right now, from uh, Curse of the Frozen Casket. So it's from uh, SKL, or Seven Kings of the Land. So just keep that in mind if you're planning on grabbing some of these cards in my deck and putting them into something else. Um, so it is a two drop, one green and one colorless, and it allows you to search your magic stone deck for a card. So search, not just, you know, from the top of your deck, like we have with, uh, Red Riding Hood. So search your magic stone deck for a card and put it into your magic stone area rested. So this is the big caveat. This is the difference between 
uh, Magic Stone Analysis in this card, and this is why I only run three. It hits the field rested, but it doesn't say that you can only grab a non-special stone. So this is going to be for our dual stones, which I will talk about when I get to my, my stone deck. Um, and then you shuffle your Magic Stone deck. So, you know, stone, land ramp for days. This is amazing. Run three. I've tried it with four. It doesn't work as well. And honestly, you don't need that much. Here we have another four of my two drop field additions. This time it will be Wind Secluded Refuge, one green and one colorless. And honestly, in any deck where you've got high profile, crazy, difficult to cast creatures that you want to stick around the field, you should be running at least a couple of these. So its ability reads as such. When this card enters the field, you may draw a card. Uh, back to that importance of drawing, man. Come on, it's important. Pay attention. When a spell or ability your opponent controls uh, targets a J slash resonator, also important, J slash resonator you control, you may banish this card. If you do, cancel that spell or ability. So if somebody's doing, you know, a demon flame on you or somebody's trying to hook one of your big resonators back into your hand or just anything aggro and mean and gross, you pop this bad boy and your creature's good for that particular instance of um, spell or ability. Again, this is another one of those cards that isn't currently from Cas uh, Curse of the Frozen Casket. It's from TMS, which I actually wasn't around for this particular set, but it's the Moonlit Savior. So I run four of these puppies. They're amazing. Um, they let you draw. They protect your dudes, and they're really good for Azathoth. Here we have the second last of my chance, which in this case is Rewriting Laws, the superstar from TTW, or the Twilight Wanderer for those who weren't around for that set. It is a two drop, a one green and one colorless that has literally one of the best abilities you could want out of a two drop for something that you need to cast so that you can get tokens. It reads as such, magic zones you control gain, tap and produce any color. That's any color, okay? Even ones that don't exist, okay? You just look at this card. If you see on there, it exists. If it doesn't, it can do that too. Until the end of turn. It also has recover up to two magic stones you control and a whopping third ability to draw a card. Four of these guys. Four of them. Now, if you're running a Feet Sing deck that doesn't require you to play more than one color, that's fine. You know, you might not necessarily need to prioritize this card, but think about it. It's a two drop that could count towards the two cards you need to cast every turn. It untaps stones, two of them, which means that you're casting this card for free and you draw a card. How amazing is that? I put this in every feasting deck. I put this in any deck that can run green, honestly, because it's amazing. You can run any color. You like to so draw and it, you cast it for free. Now, one combination I particularly like to do is if I've got um, six stones out, and I want to flip Feast Sing over, but I also want to get the two free tokens from her J Ruler side. What I end up doing is I'll cast this thing first. So it casts for two of the six stones, but it untaps those. So I essentially still have my six stones. Um, it lets me draw a card. Then I'll tap the five stones to uh, flip Feast Sting over. And then I'll drop a one drop from my hand for the last remaining stone. And since it's still the same turn, even though I just judgmented her over, as long as I didn't call for a stone that turn, I used six stones to flip her, play two other spells, and got me my two tokens and buffs to everything. How great is that? I run four, you should two. Alrighty, my final, and honestly one of my favorite chants that I've got in this deck, are three of this particular amazing lady. Protection of Alice, two hard cast green, with the following ability. Add a resonator gets plus 200, plus 200 for each resonator you control. That is each resonator you control with a deck where you're pumping out essentially two, three creatures a turn. And then once you flip her over, you're going to be running four or five creatures a turn if you can keep up the drawing and the mana production. This thing stacks up so quickly, you don't need those crazy big monsters in your deck. You know, like those, those resonators that you cast like the Cthulhu of God are only to be one of the many shitstorm creatures that these guys are going to have to deal with when you're facing them. It is a two drop. Honestly, if this thing drew you a card too, it would probably be one of the most valuable cards in this deck. I love it. You should run three. I've tried four. It's meh, but run three because it's taking up a slot for potential drawing. 
And for anybody who's looking for it, it is from the set BFA or Battle for Adoractia. Stones in this deck are super simple, since I'm only running two different colors and I've already got rewriting laws to make up for any discrepancies in mana at any particular time or will. I've got four of these dual green-black stones, which I guess are Magic Stone of Black Silence. They're phenomenal. I love the art on these. Oh my god, the Magic Stones from... from uh, Curse of the Frozen Casket are just so beautiful, you know, like I used to have a set of the old ones of the old dual stones But like those ones are child's play. Those are your, you know, diner dive uh, Coloring mat for children colored in outside of the lines in comparison to these beauties Oh my god, the dual stones easily one of the nicest most beautiful artwork that came out of this newest set And then of course to keep things nice and rounded I keep a 10 stone deck the way I've played the deck, I kind of run out of stones if I make it to too far late game, but that just means that I've freed up my uh, Feath Sing to do some attacking game as opposed to just tapping for stones and producing tokens. So I still only run the 10 stones, um, the 4 green-black dual stones, and then 6 of the basic wind magic stones. Um, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys, for this, my first Force of Will deck profile for Spot Gaming. This was Master Fija. I hope you guys enjoyed this green-black rendition of the very played right now Feet Sting J Ruler in a deck I like to call the Dark Elves of the Black Forest Worshippers of the Lords of Cthulhu deck. I know it's a, a bit of a mouthful, no pun intended, but uh, I'll try to come up with a snazzy acronym for it. If you guys are interested in what I'm doing with these cards and you guys want to get a deck list, you know, in case... You're, you can't see this video, it's in the description below. Uh, if you guys want to drop me a comment, maybe help me improve this deck, or, you know, just uh, ask me what my favorite kind of ice cream is. Just uh, drop a comment, you know, in the, the appropriate section for comments and commenting related activities. Uh, drop a like, and I'll see you guys for my next video. Peace!